Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin, and I'm the training coordinator with the Association of State Floodplain Managers. I'd like to welcome you to our June 2023 presentation uh, in the Cooperating Technical Partners Information Exchange webinar series. Today, we're going to be talking about the Federal Flood Risk Management Standard. Uh, but before we do that, I have a few administrative announcements. I want to just let you all know ahead of time how things are going to how things are going to run today. So, um, without much further ado, I will get into those announcements. Uh, first thing I want to let you all know: um, with the size of the group today, we've gone ahead and muted all participants' lines. Uh, so you won't be able to have like a verbal exchange today, but we do want you to participate. And to that end, um, if you have questions or comments about anything you see today, you can drop those into the Q&A section of the Zoom platform here. Um, and we'll take as many questions as we can, um, as, as long as time allows for it, we're gonna take as many questions as we can. So questions and comments, please throughout the, the presentation, drop those in and we'll try to take them in order or as best best of an order as makes sense. So uh, Q&A is the way to participate today. Uh, we'll also have a few poll questions. Those will pop up on your screen uh, when the time comes. So uh, you just go ahead and respond to those um, and we'll move on that way. So that's gonna be the two primary ways uh, that we engage with the audience and, and you all can participate. Um, wanna let you know, all know that this is also being recorded. So if you miss something, if we're going too fast or if you're taking notes or if you just want to reference it for any reason later, um, that recording will be made available. It'll take about a week uh, to turn that recording around. So just wanted to let you know we are recording. Next thing I want to get to is continuing education credits. So this presentation is pre-approved for one CEC for certified floodplain managers. Um, and if you're a national level CFM who attends the entire event and participates, uh, you'll be receiving that credit automatically. We'll add that to your records automatically. Again, processing time takes about a week, sometimes slightly longer. Um, that said, if, you, if you're uh, viewing this in a group setting, we're not gonna be able to give credit to those uh, viewers in your group. So I just wanna let you know, uh, credit is, is distributed sort of on an individual basis, depending on who's registered. Um, along with CEC credits, uh, we'll be issuing certificates of attendance. So if you're not a national level CFM, if you're in an accredited state, for instance, or if you just need a certificate of attendance for, for any other professional purpose, uh, so long as you, you are on for the duration today, we'll be sending you a certificate of attendance emailed to you uh, one week after the event. So, so please look out for that as well. Um, just a, a few additional notes here um, that, you know, this CTP webinar series um, is always looking for great topics. So if you have any ideas you think would make a lot of sense um, for this group, please go ahead and reach out to Alan Luloff. His email's up on the screen there. Um, and, and we'll definitely fold that into our consideration. So um, with that, um, that uh, kind of constitutes my admin announcements, and we can start getting into the presentation and the topic at hand today. Uh, and so for that, I'd like to turn it over to Alan Luloff. Alan's a program manager in the Flood Science Center here at ASFPM. He's going to tell us a little bit about the, the CTP subcommittee and, and about what we can all expect from the presentation today. So Alan, go ahead and take it away. Hello. Uh, yes, this is part of our uh, uh, information exchange process for the Cooperating Technical Partner Subcommittee. Uh, the Cooperating Technical Partner Subcommittee is a subcommittee of the Mapping and Engineering Standards Committee. And uh, the co-chairs of that are Joanna Rolf with uh, Kansas and Dave Gannett with Maryland. And uh, you can see the primary goals that we have here. And it's, it's a mechanism of trying to provide some information exchange opportunities, information for people involved in the Cooperative Technical Partner Program 
uh, and promoting the and documenting the value of CTPs. Uh, the ASFPM uh, Board of Directors passed a resolution supporting the Cooperative Technical Partners Program, and that's when they created this subcommittee of the Mapping and Engineering Standards Committee. So today, uh, we've kind of covered the logistics already. Uh, I'm, I've been provided a little bit of introduction here. And then uh, Andrew Martin and Shanna Reese are going to provide some information on the Federal Flood Risk Management Standard. Uh, get that uh, acronym in your brain. And uh, and then uh, Dave Gannett is going to be talking about their, their uh, program in Maryland, where they assess the uh, uh, areas impacted by a BFE plus one, two, and three uh, uh, foot feet above the BFE and did an, an, an assessment of, of the number of structures that would be impacted. So Dave is going to be providing that. Uh, they call that, uh, they've got an acronym for that called CRAB. And then we're going to have that uh, some time for questions and discussions. And like Kevin indicated, we leave a, a try to leave a segment. That's why these uh, webinars are an hour and a half instead of an hour to make sure we have time for questions and discussion. So. Okay, great. Thank you, Alan. Um, I think with that, we'll turn it over to Andrew. Hi, everyone. So just real quick, um, I'm actually my colleague, Shannon Reese from the Office of Environmental Planning and Historic Preservation will be going first in this presentation, then I'll follow her up. So I'm just going to hand it right off to Shannon, and I'll get the slides up on the screen. Great. Thanks so much, Andrew. And thank you, everyone, for tuning into this virtual session to hear a little bit more about the Federal Flood Risk Management Standard. Uh, this session is going to become increasingly more technical, and it is a CTP session uh, as we go along here. So I wanted to set the stage with some background information on the Federal Flood Risk Management Standard. Uh, that's a mouthful, so for the rest of this part of the session, I'm just going to call it FFRMS. So we can hit to the next slide. Hmm. Okay, perfect. Um, so FFRMS may sound familiar to many of you, as it was previously authorized by President Obama through Executive Order 13690 in 2015. Uh, President Biden recently reinstated the federal, the federal Flood Risk Management Standard. This is why we go by FFRMS. <laughs> On May 20th, 2021, uh, the Executive Order 14030, Climate Related Financial Risk. Uh, FFRMS is a flexible framework that amends Executive Order 11988, Floodplain Management, to address future and current flood risks and ensure federally funded projects last as long as they're intended to. As flood risks are anticipated to increase due to climate change and other threats, FFRMS FFRMS offers FEMA and other federal agencies a way to protect their investments by increasing resilience for their new construction and SISD or substantial improvement, substantial damage projects. All right, and we can hit the next slide. Okay, so federal agencies must determine which of the following approaches they will use to establish the FFRMS floodplain. There are three ways to establish the FFRMS floodplain. The first of which is shown here, the climate informed science approach. Uh, or as we refer to it, CISA, C-I-S-A, which utilizes best available information and actionable h, &H data uh, incorporated for current and future changes in flood risk based on climate science. Uh, the graph to the right of the screen uh, depicts relative sea level rise under different scenarios ranging from low to high. Um, and we pulled this graph from the most recent state of the science report, which you can find that online currently. <laughs> Um, this is the second method for determining the FFRMS uh, floodplain, the freeboard value approach, or FBA, where we simply add freeboard to the base flood elevation. Um, the amount of freeboard dependent on whether the project is critical or non-critical. You can see that notation at the bottom of the screen. We have two feet for non-critical actions and three feet for critical actions. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit more later to show you guys an example. Uh, next slide, we've got our third approach to establishing the FFRMS floodplain, which is the 0.2% annual chance flood approach. Essentially, that's just using the 0.2% annual chance floodplain as our FFRMS floodplain level. All agencies are looking at various FFRMS approaches to meet the executive order requirements and to craft their own agency policy. Next slide. All right. 
Something that came out with the Executive Order 14030 is an emphasis on natural and nature-based solutions in these programs. So with that, the FFRMS seeks to improve the implementation of Executive Order 11988 by encouraging the use of natural systems, ecosystem processes, and nature-based approaches in the development of alternatives for federal actions. Considering nature-based solutions on federally funded projects where appropriate, recognize the growing role of natural and restored systems and processes in mitigating flood risk and building resilience of federal investments both within and surrounding floodplains. Using natural and nature-based approaches is consistent with Section 1 of Executive Order 11988, which directs federal departments and agencies to take action to restore and preserve the natural and beneficial values of floodplains. I wanted to take some time here uh, to mention that FEMA has recently published the Building Community Resilience with Nature-Based Solutions Guide Series, which helps uh, community leaders use nature-based solutions to minimize the risk of natural hazards. You can see that link for our March 2023 one. I think that is the second publication. There is an initial first publication that came out uh, trying to help identify where nature-based solutions play a part for our local governments. Um, yeah, and we can pop to the next slide. Thanks, Andrew. All right, to implement FFRMS, the executive order uh, also requires agencies to update their regulations. Um, as you can see from this slide, the FFRMS would change how federal agencies currently define and regulate floodplains. For more details on the information within this slide, uh, you can visit the fall 2022 unified agenda. If you wanna see what FEMA's put out, you can navigate to the Department of Homeland Security, select updates to floodplain management and protection of wetlands and regulations, and you should land here, um, and it should have some of the same language in here. All of that's public, and you can use it in your presentations if you wish. All right, now we are jumping to partial implementation. So up to this point, I've really only talked generally about the FFRMS. Um, you know, all federal agencies have to have their own FFRMS policy and rule, as we just covered. Uh, We've only really spoken in general terms, but as we go into this partial implementation business, that's something that FEMA has done. So I just want to make that clear. So in the spirit of the executive order, um, where are we? Um, sorry. Uh, in the spirit of the executive order, uh, FEMA wanted to ensure that in this interim period, while we get our rule and policy together, and that we have met the requirements of the executive order while we get all that together. So we created partial implementation policies for FEMA's programs, um, hazard mitigation and public assistance both have one and then our grants program directorate implements through notice of funding opportunities. Uh, actions subject to these interim policies and NOFOs will now be more resilient to both current and future flood risks. All right. And we can go to the next, oh no, you were right. Go to the last one, sorry. All right, there we go. Um, pursuant to these interim policies, um, FFRMS requires a higher vertical uh, flood elevation for certain non-critical and critical actions to help ensure that communities affected by future flood disasters are less vulnerable to the loss of life and property and to uh, improve the resilience of these projects. Public assistance signed a partial implementation FFRMS policy on June 3rd, 2022, um, and that accounts for non-critical and critical actions within the FFRMS floodplain. Uh, hazard mitigation interim FFRMS policy was initially published on August 26, 2021. It was revised and reissued on December 7, 2022, um, so that it could include critical actions and a few other mitigation actions as eligible uh, FFRMS actions. The Grants Program Directorate, or GPD, has been implementing FFRMS requirements via a Notice of Funding Opportunity, NOFOs, from 2021 through 2023, and it mostly utilizes the language that is found in the Hazard Mitigation Partial Implementation Policy. Um, the December 7th update to that Hazard Mitigation Policy reflects the addition of those critical actions, um, and the 2022 or 2023 Grants Program Directorate NOFO language also has that. Um, for our next slide, I'm going to show a picture of what that looks like in action when you're considering critical and non-critical facilities. Um, and I have an end note here just to remind you guys that all partial implementation policies will be superseded when our formal FEMA-wide FFRMS policy does come out. All right. So as you can see in the picture, um, 
we have an example of what we believe the FFRMS floodplain looks like currently utilizing our FEMA partial implementation policies. Um, you can see uh, on the left of the screen is a residential uh, structure uh, that we would have this as a non-critical action. That's our example there. I think to the right is a fire station uh, that we're considering a critical action. Um, I want you guys to notice the light blue 1% floodplain uh, just above the channel. And then those three FFRMS layers that were right above it. So you can see the plus two and plus three as the freeboard value of it, yes. and that 0.2% laid in there on top. Um, For where? Oh, I think somebody is not on mute. Um, so please check that. Okay. So look at What's those different. Okay, uh, look at those different oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. levels. Um, and you can see that the critical structure has to be the higher of uh, that's the plus Hold three. on just a moment here, oh, Shannon, house. bear with me. Yes, sure thing. Um, I'm gonna try to figure is, out who's talking. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, Swan, Swanson. It's very that's odd fine. that. I think it's Dave. Yeah, Dave. <laughs> it is not, it is not Dave. I, I see the. Okay. Microphone was was turned on, but I'm off. Two one five six one. Oh my gosh, this is and, okay. and that's not coming up. I wonder if that's because it's um a rental. Oh. If if you're listening, uh, please mute your lines. Everybody who's an attendee should be muted. So unless it's a presenter, I'm not sure what's going on. Okay. All right, Shannon, let's give it a try. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll just reiterate, find that 1% above the channel and that's representative of your um, base flood elevation. You the plus two and plus three as the free value approach with that 0 0.2 level uh, up on top. Those levels will be interspersed in different scenarios. This is just one example to try to explain how the higher of the lower of works for our FEMA partial implementation policies. Um, so yeah, left, uh, non-critical action represented by the house on stilts, right, that firehouse um, as a critical action. So for us, uh, in our personal implementation policies currently, you have to compare um, the higher of and the lower of. So it would be the higher of the plus three freeboard value approach, which is in green, uh, versus the 0.2%. As you can see, the higher of those two is that 0.2% level. And so that fire station was moved partially out of the floodplain and on top um, through stilts um, to that 0.2% level. Um, so you can see nearly the opposite on uh, the non-critical structures, lower of those levels, you're choosing the lower of the 0.2% or the plus two uh, foot freeboard value approach. Uh, here, the lower of those two is that plus two level and that's where that house was mitigated to. Hopefully that gives you guys a clear picture, but yeah, I do want to emphasize too, it's not always going to be plus two, plus three, 0 0.2, that 0 0.2 is going to float. Um, so other scenarios will look different based on um, your topographic conditions and the project itself. All right. And that's really all I have there. So just by encouraging communities to guide development to those low risk areas and by requiring the elevation of new buildings and existing buildings that undergo significant improvement or when such buildings have sustained substantial damage, the long-term objective of reducing flood damage and losses is being realized. Uh, at this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Andrew Martin and thank you so much, Andrew, for sharing part of your technical session. Hey, Andrew, sorry about this, um, this kind of cross talking going on. I, I'm not sure if it's um, maybe an attendee who's who's called in with their phone, but I'm going to be trying to find them and mute them. Hey, okay. Hey, okay. Hey, Kevin, I, I have a I have a, 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 a some information here. I I one of my coworkers I sent that invitation that wasn't the one I logged into, and she maybe logged in as me. So if you see yeah, my don't mute, send people. Talk. Okay, go ahead. Make sure she's muted, please, Dave, and then we can proceed. I'm I've, I've chatted her, but if you can mute that name for me at the top, that won't mute me in the in the, in the invite. All right, I'm just going to jump on, jump on in, Kevin. Yeah, that sounds great, Andrew. Go ahead. All right, uh, so hey, everyone, uh, Andrew Martin, 
FEMA headquarters. I'm the risk management directorate uh, here in the engineering services branch. We're the folks that uh, we make the, the flood maps. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of things today. The first um, is just some general coordination that we've been doing on FFRMS with the White House, with other federal agencies, uh, just to kind of set the stage and make sure that everybody's on the same page as we you know, begin the implementation of this um, federal flood risk management standard. And then I'll get a little bit into the data development, what that looks like, what it's going to entail, some of the challenges we've encountered thus far, and what the timeline looks like um, in terms of getting that data and information out. So, apologies. Slides are out of order on my side. There we go. Okay, so. So FEMA has been involved with um, interagency working groups going back almost two years at this point um, in order to set the stage for the implementation of this executive order. Um, we, FEMA's role in this um, is big. We have a large part to play in the implementation of the executive order. Um, our floodplain management division is all about, you know, interagency coordination within the federal government. So, you know, if uh, general services need some assistance, if HUD needs some assistance, any federal agency out there, you know, can, will be able to reach out to us and we will support the implementation of this executive order through our floodplain management division uh, and making sure they understand exactly what's going on, what kind of data is available and where they can look to for, you know, a deeper dive into uh, in information. Uh, so our floodplain management folks are working with OEHP, which is Shannon's division, uh, to understand some of the implementation challenges. Uh, we're coordinating with the executive office of the president, which includes CEQ, OSTP, OMB, and frankly, just a number of other agencies um, and executive offices, just to make sure that everybody understands what's going on, and what challenges are arising and you know, working through some problems. Uh, we have the Flood Resilience Interagency Working Group, um, which has a number of subgroups, which uh, I'm involved with, OEHP is involved with, and Flood Fund Management is involved with. Um, to date, the, the agency that I personally am working the, the closest with at this time on the data development side is NOAA. Um, you know, FEMA has the objective of, de of developing the data and assisting with the implementation. NOAA plays a couple of different parts in this, but the big one in, in terms of the data side is provided, they are going to provide a web-based interactive tool um, so that end users, whether at the federal level or at the grantee level, um, can get more information about what the FFRMS guide, you know, some guidance from on FFRMS through something called a decision support tool. I'm not going to get too into that decision support tool right now. Um, and NOAA will be sharing information in the very near future on what that looks like and, um, you know, how that's going to work. Um, but for now, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the data. So real quick on that interagency working group, um, it was set up by the White House uh, Climate Policy Office in response to the executive order being issued. Uh, it's co-led by CEQ, OMB, and us at FEMA to coordinate all the federal agencies implementation. Uh, the interagency working group reports the cabinet, cabinet level national climate task force, which was charged to establish a whole of government approach to addressing the climate crisis that increases resilience to the impacts of climate change. And again, our entry point is the mitigation director at floodplain management division, uh, who works with across the agency and outside the agency. And here's some of the, the key POCs um, on that part of it. Uh, Jesse Elif, Shannon, who you just met, um, Larissa Hyatt. I think they need to update this. And then uh, on the floodplain management, it's Jennifer Tylander. Jeffrey Hurd and a couple more that are supposed to be coming online very soon. We do have a number of regional staff um, that have been hired through floodplain management. Each region will have um, at least one FFRMS specialist 
working in the region to assist grantees in that region, um, you know, that's going to be a big help. This is a big effort. It's going to you know, require a lot of folks to make sure things are done correctly and implementa implemented appropriately. All right. So I'm going to jump right into the data development side of this. So as Shannon mentioned, you know, there are three ways that FFRMS can be implemented. We have the, the climate informed science approach, the freeboard value approach, and then the 0.2% flood approach. Um, the size of the climate informed science approach, we have a lot of information on climate informed science and sea level rise, particularly in the Atlantic and Gulf Coast, um, where it's not quite reached consensus level on exactly what those um, and what that looks like is largely on the West Coast and the uh, Pacific Islands and Alaska and in the interior of the country um, where flood is largely driven by precipitation events. So we're not quite fully there yet for climate informed science approach everywhere. Um, so we're building data to support the freeboard value approach and the 0.2% flood approach. And we're going to build that nationally. Um, so why we're going to do that is because the executive order requires all federal agencies to figure out how they're, you know, how each of them is going to implement the FFRMS. Science-driven agencies like NOAA and USGS, and, um, engineering-driven agencies like Army Corps of Engineers and Department of Transportation, and agencies that have significant uh, science and or engineering components like FEMA and Department of Defense can, you know, largely figure this stuff out on their own. But there's a lot of other federal agencies out there that do not have the background in science or engineering um, or the capacity to figure this out solely by themselves. So we've been asked to develop mapping data to assist other agencies with the implementation. Uh, we make the flood maps that many lay users already are already familiar with, and it makes a lot of sense for us to build this uh, mapping data uh, based on the products that so many know and love. You know, and I also wanted to mention that many states, you know, many of the states across the country have already started to adopt uh, freeboard and flood damage prevention ordinances. Many communities have adopted, uh, you know, freeboard into their floodplain, their flood damage prevention ordinances. Um, and these products were that show the plus two and plus three, and actually we're gonna build a range of uh, freeboard values. Those communities in those states that are already utilizing these higher uh, freeboard standards, they can just use our data right off the shelf, which will be great. All right. Oh, you know, I wanted to mention a couple more things. Um, so, you know, one thing that might be like a hopeful outcome of this is that we start to see states and communities, in addition to the ones that already are already doing this, additional states and communities start to adopt and adjust their ordinances to include the horizontal extent of the freeboard uh, based on the floodplain rather than just the vertical. And, you know, that could potentially prevent a significant amount of damage in future floods. So I'm gonna focus on the details of what we're building to support the FFRMS, uh, which the freeboard value approach. This is not super fancy technology. This is not, you know, stochastic storm transposition this is a big GIS exercise. And you know, honestly, coming from a background of mapping in GIS, I'm actually old enough that I, my first mapping class, um, I learned how to do things by hand and then got into GIS toward my senior year in college. Um, but ever since that time, the first time that I started working with maps, I knew this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to make maps for the rest of my life. Uh, this is you know, what gets me up in the morning. And this project in particular, this is like the realization of, of those you know, dreams I had in college of you know, doing something really, really influential and cool. And I am, you know, I am very fortunate um, to be able to take on this effort and you know, I'm gonna do my best for everyone. Um, this is a big deal for me and I want you to know I'm taking it very seriously. Um, anyway, long story short, this is not the you know, niftiest things in terms of technology, but it is very, very impactful. It's going to make a big difference in terms of our long-term resilience, how our tax dollars are spent, 
making sure that the investments that we're making with those tax dollars are going to help inform smarter, more informed decisions. So I'm excited about that. Um, so as we've been thinking about building this data set, some of the challenges we've faced over the last year, two years, has been landing on exactly what we're going to build, you know, figuring out how much it's going to cost. Um, you know, we've never done we've never done a mapping effort on this scale before all at the same time. Sure, we've built firms across the country, but those were, you know, in pieces. Um, each of the regions, you know, comes up with firms based on regional priorities and state priorities and community priorities, but they're not all done at the same time. You know, it's, that program's been going on for many, many years. We're doing this all at once, the entire country in the next year. Um, you know, a lot of coordination around this with FEMA, the other federal agencies, the administration, then adjusting as needed to ensure that we get it right and within the budget available. The good news is we're very, very close to getting started. I mean, very close, um, probably weeks, with building that mapping information. And I'll give you a rundown of what this is going to look like. And before I do that, I mean, I've got this on the screen now, but I wanted to say one more thing. You know, Executive Order 11988 has been in place for nearly 50 years since the Carter administration. Um, that executive order in of itself has saved billions in taxpayer dollars just by, you know, making sure that we're making a smarter decision about where we cite things in the floodplain. Um, and that is, you know, continues to be a critical element of review for uh, federally funded projects. However, 1198 is based on what is right now, what was in the recent past, you know, the, the flood risk as, it, as we know it today. FFRMS is based on what will be, looking to the future to ensure the long-term flood resilience of federal investment based on climatic changes. You know, building on 1198, this is going to save even more billions of dollars in making sure that our tax dollars are invested more wisely. All right, so let's get to the to the meat and potatoes here. Um, so again, we've been charged with developing this freeboard value approach data, um, and that information is going to be plugged into a decision support tool, which is being developed by NOAA. Um, we've been working again internally and externally to lock down exactly what these technical requirements look like. Um, you know, initially, you know, we've had to make some adjustments over the last year just based on what kind of budget was available on how expansive our inventory would be for the mapping. Um, you know, this slide lists out some of the highlights of what will be the final approach. So, you know, freeboard value floodplains using existing digital effective model backed data, model backed flood hazard information nationally. So this is only where we have effective firms, and it's only where there's models to support the flood hazards shown in those firms. So uh, non-model-backed A zones, not going to get FFRMS right now. BLE data is not going to get FFRMS right now. Preliminary data is not going to get FFRMS right now. I hope that in the future we're able to do that, but right now it's going to be solely based on existing digital effective model back data. This will be done for riverine and coastal flood hazards everywhere where we have those uh, key ingredients. Um, these floodplain, this floodplain, this floodplain information will be developed in raster format only. So there'll be you know, little cells with um, flood elevations plugged into them. That's really going to be the only piece of information inside of each of those cells. It's just going to be a flood elevation. We're also going to include, right at the beginning, we're going to do a full inventory of everything that's already out there. Um, the gentleman who is following our presentation, Dave Gunier from Maryland, has already built some really cool stuff for the state of Maryland. We don't want to you know, duplicate that effort. Wherever that exists, we want to use it where we can. So we're going to do a full inventory of that, see what we can use, and plug that in where possible. Okay, um, so we'll have 1% annual chance flood elevation raster floodplains for freeboard value approach plus one, plus two, and plus three scenarios and associated flood freeboard value approach elevations everywhere. 
coastal and riverine, um, obviously using digital effective flood hazard information um, for areas where climate informed science approach is not yet ready. But th this plus one, plus two, plus three in 500 years is going to be every single square inch of the country where we have digital effective model back data. In the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic coast, where we do have broad consensus on sea level rise projections, we will include plus one through plus 10, every foot, whole foot increment from plus one to plus 10. Um, the idea here is that we'll use NOAA uh, sea level rise projection ranges based on life expectancy of the project. So the concept is you go to the, the NOAA decision support tool, you give them an address or a lat long, you drop that in, it tells you, well, you drop that in and then it asks you what's the you know, expected life expectancy of this project. And you say, okay, it's uh, 21, 2100. You type that in and it'll give you the expected sea level rise for that location at the year 2100. And let's say it's three feet or 3.1 feet. You can utilize the plus three freeboard value to get the elevation that's needed for that um, to start thinking about how to incorporate that elevation into your design plans. So it's a cool feature. And then of course, we'll have the 0.2% annual chance floodplains uh, where those exist. Um, I'll talk a little bit about where we are in this process. Um, we, are, we are at the very, very end of contract negotiations. Uh, we are hoping to start working in the next few weeks. Um, and our first data sets are likely going to be delivered to us here at FEMA um, by late August, early September. Now, this is still tentative, but I feel fairly high level of confidence that that's our timeline. Um, we will, our intent is to, is to develop all this data nationwide in the next 12 months. So by July of 2024, we hope to have this entire suite of data completed. And as we, as we go, you know, I, I will be getting a data deliverable every four weeks starting late August, early September, do some quality analysis, quality control on that data, and then provide it directly to NOAA so that they can incorporate it into their decision support tool. All right, so this is just a little uh, taste of what this might, what this would look like. The graphic on the left is the, you know, the, the floodplains we all know and love, the 1% and the 0.2%, the light blue being the one and the, the red line indicating the 0.2% flood elevation and the, the inland inundation of that. The graphic on the right shows plus one through plus 10. Um, you know, this is just a, a fancy GIS graphic, but it, it, it indicates the amount of additional inundation that might occur given these scenarios. And it's pretty significant as you can see. Okay, so as we were getting ready for this nationwide implementation, this data development effort, um, we, we take on a couple of pilot projects just to kind of figure out exactly how we wanted to do this. Um, you know, we had a lot of questions going in, a lot of different thoughts about how to apply this. And, you know, we employed two pilot studies to try to figure this out. And I'll get into a little bit of the details of that here. Uh, so pilot study number one, and we used all of our uh, contract providers. Um, we asked them to work together with me. Um, we developed um, freeboard value approach floodplains um, for a random sample of 400 square miles across the country, looking at a whole lot of different um, potential uh, challenge areas, if you will. We used uh, 10 square mile sample grids, um, including Atlantic and Gulf coastal flood zones, as well as riverine and other coastal and flood zones. Uh, we did use some parameters on how we chose these uh, sample areas. Largely, you know, we wanted to avoid areas that didn't have any flood hazard indicated on the NFHL. We wanted to, but that was really one of the biggest ones. We wanted to avoid, um, you know, federal lands to the extent possible because we didn't, there's not, firm data in many of those areas. We wanted to make sure that we were using, you know, data, using air, looking at areas that had effective digital flood hazard data. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were using the, the most current and 
highest resolution digital elevation model, model data. So, you know, let's say in the coast of Maine, we might have one meter topography, even though the effective study might have used 10 meter um, DEMs, if there was a one meter available, I directed them to use that because we're going to have a better understanding of exactly the extent of the floodplain based on the original models with that updated topography. Um, we calculated the horizontal expanse for each of the free boards to develop an average. We did the same for the 0.2%. Um, that was for some internal reasons, but you know it was helpful, useful information. All right, so again, this was largely a GIS um, effort, um, and we did not go back to the original H&H &H models um, to do this. We just used the outputs, the, mo the mapping that already exists. Um, we did develop, um, we did a couple of different things. <laughs> um, we, we basically, I don't know how much into the details of the GIS stuff we should go into, but um, we, I'll, I'll hit it at a high level. We extracted the SFHA boundaries from the NFHL, from, you know, equaling the effective firm database. We generated water surface elevation um, rasters using the static base flood elevations for coastal areas and for riverine areas, then used the existing cross sections and extended them to create a, a water surface elevation grid. Uh, the raster cell size, the, the rules that we set in place were the raster cell size and alignment must match the underlying USGS DEM grid cells. Um, we have since adjusted that um, to, to create some more efficiencies in processing and storage. So if we have a one meter underlying DEM, um, we're actually upsampling to three meter grids. Um, the amount of resolution that we lose is, is very minor. And the amount of efficiency gained is, is great. Um, the, the amount of data storage that the one meter cells uh, require is, it's crazy. And the processing time save um, is immense as well. So we felt that was the best way to go. All right, so here's um, a couple examples from our first pilot study. Uh, again, in the coastal areas, we did create uh, freeboard value mapping from plus, plus one all the way to plus 10. Uh, on the left-hand side, the 1% flood is the white and gray, and the darker colors are the, the higher freeboard values um, and their corresponding horizontal extents. Mm -hmm. you know, and again, the steeper the topography is, the less horizontal extent that we would expect to see. So, you know, the map there on the left shows, you know, a fair amount of additional inundation, but it's not crazy. The one on the right, that's a coastal area. I believe that's in uh, coastal Louisiana. You know, when you get to the plus 10, you basically see the entire land area completely inundated. Um, so you can see how dramatic that impact of the plus 10 is in coastal areas or low-lying areas relative to steeper terrain areas. Okay, our second pilot study was a little bit larger in um, scope. Um, instead of, the, instead of this, the 10 square mile grids, uh, which we used in the first pilot study, we looked at countywide and watershed wide uh, scale. I think we did six, one, two, three, four, seven, we did seven projects across the country. So the intent here with the second pilot study was to start to provide step by step guidance on how to construct these FFRMS uh, freeboard floodplains and the corresponding horizontal extents. Um, and it was also to give us an idea of what we could expect in terms of level of effort and best practices as we scale this up to a national level. Um, so it was a very worthwhile initiative. And here's the locations where that pilot study was uh, initiated. A couple out west in Colorado and Washington State, uh, the interior part of the country at Harris County, Texas, and Wyandotte County, Kansas. Then the East Coast, we had Rockingham County, New Hampshire, Chatham County, Georgia, and 
Puerto Rico. I think we did the entire uh, main island of Puerto Rico. Okay, so some results here, um, just a little flavor of what this, you know, is going to look like. Um, we did the, the water surface elevation and depth grids. Um, we developed those with the regulatory data, based on the regulatory data. We reconciled different data sets across flood study boundaries uh, to get an understanding of where to gather the latest data and how to combine the data sets to produce water, seamless water surface elevation grid. That's a huge challenge, um, especially in areas like when you're going across counties, for example. You know, sometimes there's a river that separates two counties and in County X on the west side of the river, the study was performed in 1987, and in County Y on the, on the east side of the river, the study was done in 2013. You can have wildly different water surface elevations. It's a huge challenge for floodplain managers. Um, so we've been working to figure out how to address issues like this. Uh, we also looked at you know, trying to work with best available data. So I mentioned early on that, you know, I wasn't able to do FFRMS, FEA data, data development for preliminary studies for BLE, um, unfortunately. I really wanted to do that. I was hopeful we'd be able to, but in the hopes that we would, um, we utilized the advisory BFE data that we created for uh, Puerto Rico, you know, immediately following Hurricane Maria, um, just to, you know, test it out. Uh, this, you know, this was actually a really good study. It was a really good pilot. It gave us a lot of good um, samples and examples of how to do this nationally. Um, we had some really good challenges. Um, they've got their own uh, vertical datum there, um, which is a challenge because there's not a direct conversion from NAVI 88 to the Puerto Rico vertical datum of 2002. Um, <laughs> We had to utilize some different approaches for data gathering um, for the bare earth BEM was applied for Puerto Rico. Um, yeah, and we had some areas, even though we had pretty widespread, really high resolution DEMs for most of the island, um, there were some areas with very, very low resolution DEMs. We had to create kind of a patchwork, um, which caused some challenges with the freeboard mapping with the, with the significantly different uh, topography resolutions. All right, so the, the next one, this is in uh, Washington State. Um, this area has various zones mapped on the firms. They've got A, AE, AO, and 0.2%, a number of different sources of terrain data. Um, so that was an interesting challenge. It created some waterfalls that we weren't expecting. Um, and some portions of this study, um, the water service elevations were in NGBD 29, so we had to convert to NAVD 88. All right, so just again, touching on some of the challenges we faced, um, you know, merging the different flood earth studies, um, you know, very difficult to marry up when you have significantly different uh, BFEs, you know, along county boundaries. We've got a lot of areas that are not modernized, obviously across the country. Zone A is without cross sections, without studies, without uh, models. You know, we hadn't decided a year ago that we were going to exclude non-model backed A zones. Uh, so we were trying to figure out approaches for how to do that in the instance that we were able to do that. Um, and of course, water surface elevations are not available for zone AO areas. So that's a challenge too. I mean, I know as floodplain managers, many of you have had to figure out how to do that on your own. And, you know, largely the approach that we came up with would look like that, um, you know, finding out what the, uh, the AO zone is and then calculating the elevation of that based on the topography. Okay, so a lot of low resolution DEMs, um, vertical data, different vertical datum differences between multiple flood risk studies and the USGS DEM and flood control structures such as levees and dams, uh, big challenge. And you know, I'll touch on that last one a little bit. Ultimately, what we decided to do for levees and dams is we're just taking the, the effective data as is and adding the freeboard. It's not perfect, it's not a perfect approach, but it is utilizing what's published on the firms. And um, you know, largely, if somebody's gonna build 
something in an area behind uh, an accredited levy or an, even a non-accredited levy, the intent is for them to go reach out to their FEMA region and to work with their FFRMS specialist to, to ensure that they, everybody has the right understanding of what the right approach is to implementing FFRMS in that location. We will have some information available through the data we build and through the decision support tool, but in, in generally in no circumstances should the information you know, that comes out of this be the sole criteria for design. Um, there should always be some discussion with FEMA on how to do this and how to apply it correctly and to make sure that you're meeting the intent of the executive order. This data is going to provide a huge assist in that, you know, understanding the design criteria, but it is not the sole factor here. All right, and so I've got a couple of little screenshots here. Dave, who's following me, has got some really cool stuff he's going to show. Um, but really, the high-level takeaway here is, you know, as we add the freeboard values, you can see that, you know, there can be a fair number of structures that are added into those floodplains, those floodplain areas, um, you know, given those additional elevations on top of the water surface. Um, you know, it can be significant. It can show significant additional inundation within a, a community. The same on this one. This is from Kansas. Just note how many additional buildings are included when you start adding this plus two and plus three. So finally, just some, some lessons learned, some best practices. Um, we are going to utilize the quality control approach that we've already kind of implemented for some of our non-regulatory data sets. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the water service elevation grids, the depth grids that are created as by the regions in you know, conjunction with regulatory study. Um, I think these are great products, but the best thing about it for me is that we already have some really cool QC ideas set up to ensure that the resulting floodplains and these water service elevation grids match up with the underlying flood hazard information. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to drop a point at you know, the, the intersection of two streams and make sure that it's within half a foot of the base flood elevation that underlies. So let's say we're at the plus three raster. We'll make sure that if the BFE says 10 feet, that the BFE plus three freeboard value is you know, plus or minus half a foot from 13. And just got to do our requirements can be 90% of the, of the points have to be within that half a foot uh, difference for all of those uh, raster cells. So that's going to create a better product. Um, we are prioritizing the data delivery approach. Um, we are using the administration's climate and economic justice screening tool um, as a critical piece of information that informs where we look to develop the data first. Uh, so we wanna make sure that disadvantaged communities and those disadvantaged communities, particularly that are at the highest um, flood exposure are the ones that we're developing the data first for. So tribal lands, US territories, and communities that you know, hit a number of those indicators are where I'm gonna start. Um, you know, we determined that GIS mapping the FFRMS floodplains is better performed at the county level. I mean, watershed is great too, but um, county level is, is good because it matches our firms. And we have the tools, resources, and the processes in place already to develop these products. So, you know, that was an important piece of information. We needed to determine that before we really move forward. Okay, um, that is it for my presentation. There's my email address if anybody would like to follow up separately after this. Again, I'm really thrilled to be here today and uh, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate the association giving me this opportunity to share this information. Um, they're a great partner. So I'm going to hand it off to either back to Kevin or to Dave. I'm not sure which next. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. I'll, I'll jump in quickly. Oh, yeah. Thanks for, for stopping to share your screen there. So before, uh, Dave, we, we get to your portion of the presentation, I am going to uh, launch our first poll question. So if you all just bear with me a moment. Um, 
it, it's just a, a question of the acronym FFRMS. So uh, go ahead, read through the options and weigh in there. And while you do that, uh, I'm going to give everybody a few seconds to do that. I just wanted to remind everybody, if you have questions uh, or comments, please send them into the Q&A area. We've, we've got a lot already. Shannon has been in there answering your questions as well. So if you've asked one, especially early on, uh, please check back in the Q&A area. You may see a response to that uh, from Shannon. So go ahead and check that out. All right. So I'm going to end the poll and just share with everybody. Most of you uh, got the correct answer. So that's awesome. Uh, and I'll stop sharing that and we will move right along. Dave, uh, please. oh, you know what, Dave? Bear with me a second. I think I actually need to um, get your line unmuted. Oh, that'd be a good idea. Okay. Yep. You're all set. Go ahead. <laughs> Let me make that bigger. Okay. Hey, sorry for the glitch. It was my fault. Do you see my screen? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, I cannot see your screen though. Oh, okay. You just hit hit share screen. I thought I did. On the bottom. Maybe you undid it. Share screen. It work this time. Share. Oh. Still waiting for it to show up. What happened? Two glitches today. Do you see the green share screen arrow? Oh, I hit that twice. I've hit that. Let's see if I move this over. Oh, there it is. Got it. I to find the tab. I had to find the right tab. How's that? Good. You're there. All right. Yep. So, so again, sorry for the glitch. That was more my fault than anybody else's. Uh, okay. So from a practical standpoint, I feel like I'm I've been you know, like uh, I'm cheating off of Andrew's uh, you know like notes because we kind of started maybe four or five years before Andrew did. Um, by the way, my name is Dave Gannett. I'm the state flood plain coordinator at Maryland. Um, so we started with a the same concept or approach as that FEMA does with the uh, FFRMS. Um, and we've been working with state agencies to implement some of this information for higher standards of resiliency. The state agencies that we've been looking at, we wanted to do this for promoting resiliency. Um, and we figured that we could do this at the state level and incorporate state standards and um, probably exceed the FEMA standards. But it also gives communities a roadmap to follow for higher standards if they want. Um, we all got, we got started like everybody else with a probably an executive order to talking about a two-foot free board. Um, our Coast Smart Council state agencies was, uh, was in 2014 was uh, stated to make uh, safe and wise investments with building or updating state agency structures located in vulnerable coastal, coastal areas. We started with category two storm surge information as our, as our boundary, but realized very quickly that we're not gonna get consistent results. So when the, T, the FM, FFRMS came out, we wanted to use that as a way to tie our ideas back into FEMA regulations that communities already knew how to use, the state agencies already knew how to use. So we started that process in 2016, and by 2020, we had updated our, our, our customer council guidelines to use this for the criteria. Um, as Andrew said, you know, like you basically have the FEMA floodplain um, on the profile view for the coast. You've got the sea level and then the, the FEMA floodplain on top. And then we take that freeboard of three feet, and are obviously you. Uh, create that vertical wall that can, can never be there. So, but if a community has a freeboard standard, then they have that vertical wall. And we wanted to kind of illustrate that you need to have an idea of understand, of what's gonna happen outside that, that floodplain or upside, outside that uh, freeboard area as you go through this process. So the red vertical arrow shows the limit of the FEMA floodplain. Um, our regulations kind of go beyond that to the left. And we started to then drag that uh, freeboard 
to the left and then create those elevations on the ground, just like Andrew did for the zero, one, two, and three feet. So how is that coming in? So it's, you get a higher elevation um, in, the, in, the, in the FEMA floodplain and you get these uh, transitional areas from zero down to, uh, to three feet, All right? So on a profile view, it looks like this. And what I'm really supposed to talk about is, uh, this will be in the slides if you wanna see a story map. And this is where we have it on our website is what, this, what we're doing with building footprints. Okay, so if you click on here, you're gonna get an elevation on the ground. Our elevations are plus or minus uh, half, of, half a foot probably in most cases. Um, in the riverine areas, we took the cross sections and added the three feet to them and, and used that information. And ended up with two and three foot depth grids, again, back in 2016, moving forward, and then have that higher standards. So here's the, here's the building footprint, so what? Uh, the FEMA floodplain is mostly the blue, the blue hatching. And if I come down, come down the slide, you can see that we're starting to now pick up more buildings. Um, we had the building footprints, so we wanted to do a count, figure out what they are and where this is all going. All right, so we have the number of buildings in the 100-year floodplain, uh, the number of buildings in the 100-year plus three, and on average, our CRAB, our CRAB, CRAB stands for Climate Ready Action Boundary. Um, you can see that we we're about 70% higher than we were than the higher than the 100 year floodplain. General observation here, people still like water and people never, don't like to pay for flood insurance. So anybody that builds tends to build just outside the theme of floodplain, still within view of water and still at risk. So we have 40,000 buildings, uh, building footprints in our coastal 100 year floodplain. Um, you can see how that goes up from one foot to two feet to three feet. It's about a 20% increase per foot um, in the coastal areas. So again, if you have 40,000 buildings, what's 20% of 40,000? In the riverine areas, it's a little higher percentage, but it's a lower number of buildings. Let's go back. I'm looking at 40,000 buildings in the FEMA coastal 100-year floodplain in Maryland, and only 14,000 more or less in the riverine sections of, of Maryland. So my percentages are higher, but I'm not sure that that's an in indication of anything, uh, but we're still around, you know, averaging around 70% to 85%, okay? So if you combine those, again, we're, we're, it comes up to about 70%, 40, 50,000 buildings, and now here's where we start the comparisons, okay? So um, you can do anything you want with statistics, and here's the 24 Maryland counties. You can see that they range from a low of 25, up to a high of 167%. Again, it's not necessarily a trend of anything here. It's just maybe an indication of how people build, how, how flat it is, and, and, and that kind of information. But if you take this over the state, what you have is $15 billion worth of flood insurance right now in the state of Maryland is covered every year. And if you add 20% just for giggles here on, on the number of people that may be living in the floodplain, but don't have a mortgage. And if I add 20% to that number, we estimate that there's 18 billion uh, worth of property coverage in Maryland in the FEMA floodplain. Well, that's the amount that if I take 70% of that, we're going to $30 billion. And then you have to add the increase for damages within the floodplain, riverine areas that are less than one square mile, um, the high hazard dams that Andrew talked about, and then areas with undersized and aging storm drains. So we know that our risk is at least 18 billion. We think our risk is probably gonna be approaching $50 billion. But oh, by the way, we're only underwriting, you know, like $18 billion more or less in, 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 in Maryland. So from a risk percentage by putting these maps out there, hopefully we're making people more aware of what these risks are, um, you can click outside the FFRMS or the CRAB in Maryland, and you'll get an idea of what your elevation is related back to the FEMA floodplain. So you can use our tool to even give you a result um, outside the, the FFRMS. So how much higher am I than the FEMA floodplain and or and or. So those in, those in, that information is all there. So I know we're gonna have a lot of questions. And I know that I went pretty fast, but I also kind of have numbers. And I think that everybody 
you know, like one, once they get their questions answered. So I'm going to stop there and, and, and go to the questions because I thought we were shorter on time than we are, but that's okay. All right, cool. Thank, thank you, Dave, for, for sharing that. Um, we did also have uh, a poll question, Dave, on, on the Maryland's crab. Did you want to get to that? Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, of course. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll check that out now. So bear with me while I get that poll open, everybody. Okay, so Maryland's uh, crab is a practical example of FFRMS. Maryland has implemented its use of 100 year plus three foot guidelines in tidal waters, floodplains for all state agency construction projects and projects receiving state funding above 500,000. So true or false to that, uh, that statement there. Uh, so take a moment, consider it. Um, and like Dave said, we do have some questions. Um, and if you have any additional questions, uh, we'll we'll kind of open up our our verbal Q and A session right now. So so go ahead and drop that in the Q and A, and we'll take as many as we can. Um, we're still getting a bunch of poll responses, so I'm going to leave it open for for just a moment. Okay. Okay, share the results with everybody. So uh, hopefully you can all see that we had 86% coming in at true and 14 at false. Um, and that that is true, Dave, correct? I, I think yep. that was the consensus there. So uh, thanks everybody for weighing in. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Just once again, get get the presenter's information up there. Um, and, and we'll start going through Q&A. Andrew and Shannon have been answering your questions uh, in writing. So if you asked a question and you don't hear it read out loud, uh, please go back and check there. We'll also send out the transcript of those uh, questions and answers uh, with all the follow-up materials. So you'll have that in case you can't find it or, or just missed it or whatever. Um, but having said that, um, we we have a question here I wanted to take from Bo, who's wondering if any type of assessment is going to be incorporated in coastal areas uh, related to, oh, <laughs> it looks like that one got answered <laughs> as I was reading it aloud. So uh, that one, uh, Bo, you, you got your answer out, out there in writing. Um, Lynn had a question from, from quite early in the presentation wondering, um, Will areas that are currently on effective paper maps also get FFRMS mapping? Not at this time. Um, that, there's a huge challenge for a couple of different reasons. One, you know, that would require digitizing, and we do have some digitization of those older um, paper-based firms, um, but we lose a lot of resolution in that process, right? Uh, there's a number of different ways that digitization has been attempted attention is the right word here, uh, for various reasons, for various purposes. Um, but we don't have a high level of confidence in the digit digitization of the old paper studies. Um, and therefore, we don't have a good underpinning for developing the FFRMS free board value mapping as well. So, I mean, it would be adding uncertainty on top of uncertainty. And, you know, I want to put out the the best product I possibly can at the highest level of confidence. You know, there's uncertainty built into this in, in a number of different places. Um, and I wanna limit the amount of that to the extent possible. So the short answer is no, um, we won't be at this time. Okay, thank you, Andrew, for that explanation. That, that's very helpful. Um, we, we had a couple of questions come in related to the, the segment uh, related to Maryland's uh, crab. So, um, Dave, this might be for you. Do any communities in Maryland use crab to regulate outside of the special flood hazard area for residential slash commercial buildings? Not yet, um, but we've had three or four ask about it because they're already realizing that from an economic uh, process that they, there's a benefit from, from going that way. So they're probably talking about it, um, probably considering it, and then probably deciding whether they have the political will to do it or not. But we, we, we're at least getting questions about it and, and people are moving forward with that, that understanding. So that's, that's encouraging. Okay, 
Great. Thank you, Dave. Um, and, and one more just came in here uh, for you, Dave. Uh, is there an example of Maryland crab being utilized and how useful it was so far? For example, uh, flooding being avoided during recent year storm events or uh, um, dollar amounts saved or anything like that? So the example is state agencies are using Maryland's crab and coastal area for siting and design. So they've been started this process about two years ago. So at least state agencies are following the guidelines and state agencies are, uh, if state funding is involved, it's gonna be a requirement in Maryland. So in coastal areas, we've already implemented it at the state level. Um, and as far as, you know, and nothing's been built because we've only been going through the siting and design over the last couple of years. So I anticipate that there'll be something, but you know, like for right now, what's going on? The interesting thing is, is that, um, as we elevate these structures with state money by up to three feet for the crab, on top of that, those structures are being elevated electrical and mechanical for critical facilities by an additional two feet. So we're getting really good sort of results on resiliency moving forward. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Dave. Um, so we have a couple of questions related to um, how these standards apply. So I'm going to take Jacob and Brian's questions kind of and and kind of uh, present them together. Uh, but the question is essentially FFRMS applies to federally funded buildings and projects, correct? Um, it's not for typical residential or commercial development. And then Brian's question is, is sort of along that line. Uh, will these standards apply to public infrastructure and who will fund the higher standards in, uh, in an already sort of fiscally constrained environment. So just some questions about, about uh, maybe trying to pinpoint where the, the standards apply, I suppose. Hey, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, I probably should emphasize this uh, a little bit more, but yes, just federally funded projects. This is really to help save taxpayer money. Um, if you are not receiving federal funding, you will not have to meet FFRMS standards. Uh, do consider, though, the weird things in there, like HUD just put their um, notice of proposed rulemaking out, and there are very specific circumstances where FFRMS would impact uh, people getting loans and all that. So yes, it's just federally funded projects, but do keep in mind it is by agency. So something that FEMA does, maybe HUD doesn't have to do, and we have to work together to make sure that uh, all of those projects are looked at um, for their requirements and that all those requirements are met. Uh, and I believe that the more stringent requirements um, will be chosen in between the agencies. So hopefully that helps a little bit there. Um, what was the other question? So rolling right back down. Uh, so, I think, uh, Shannon, I think it just had to do with um, funding, but I, I'll have to go back and look um, okay. for that question. That's totally fine. And yeah. I answered the question about funding. Um, that I, I don't remember where it was. It was maybe from half hour or so ago. Um, but basically, uh, as far as FEMA goes, your cost share will still apply. So um, if you don't want to do FFRMS, don't apply for projects. Uh, you know, like it's for federally funded projects. You are getting that money. Um, you also get your cost share. So while you know your cost share might have been this before and it might be like that now, you're still only paying for that small percentage of that um, that pie part. Uh, it should not have a significant economic impact. Um, and if it does, there are state programs uh, and a few other options that you can go to uh, for additional funding for your cost share. Uh, I don't see that this is any more burdensome um, than anything else we've done before due to uh, accounting for the FFRMS cost share. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, that helps a lot. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so we're just gonna keep going. I've got a, a few more questions here. Tim is wondering, um, is this, do you project that this uh, data will be updated in the future? And if so, with what frequency or uh, is this just sort of a one and done type of a thing for now? Good question. Um, so there's a couple different ways to answer this. Um, we are looking at updating our guidelines and standards for the mapping program uh, to incorporate this as a regular part of the, the risk map program. 
Um, we haven't done that yet. Um, we have a discrete amount of funding to do this specific effort. And, you know, we hope to get more funding from Congress to do more. Um, so for the, for the short term, yes, we're going to do this one project with the intent to continue it. Um, but I can't confirm that we have the ability to continue it, you know, at this moment. But the intent is certainly there. Great. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for, for shedding some light on that, Andrew. Um, Paul is saying, uh, you know, in Oregon, for example, communities are already starting to update ordinances based on uh, the biological opinion. Um, and he, Paul's wondering, is expectation that the model code also be updated based on FFRMS? And he he mentions that uh, that that may be sort of a, an additional layer to the process, or potentially some duplication of effort there. So just wondering um, what the expectations for the the ordinance uh, updating the ordinances might be. Okay, hey, um, so I popped this I think in another answer, but there I see very little impact to floodplain administrators unless you are the applicant. If you plan on being the applicant, obviously you're going to have to go through the regular FEMA application process and the onus is on you for whatever project you are applying for. Um, however, we, uh, we haven't discussed all of the aspects of this yet. Uh, but we don't believe that there is going to be a deep burden on floodplain administrators, of course, as long as you are not the applicant. I don't think that you guys would have to put anything in your model ordinances outside of what is already referenced. Um, you know, you will go with the higher standard, you will follow the rules of your project, all of that. Um, there could be an instance where we would need to update ordinances, but I just don't see that in the future um, with what we know about FFRMS right now. Okay, yeah, thank you, Shannon. I appreciate that. Um, Got a question from Michael. <laughs> Michael, I'm going to try to do this question justice, uh, but just bear with me, everybody. Um, uh, Michael's asking: Will models eventually be updated to revise H and H calculations as an approach to implement the standard? Um, that is, in riverine areas with increased precipitation, undersized bridges will react differently to increased flows and could give substantially increased headwater elevations for a given tailwater increase such as structure. So uh, what he's saying in other words is it would not be a fixed plus one foot or plus two foot on both sides of the same bridge, for instance. Right. I understand that. I mean, right now we're, we're just doing the freeboard value and that's what we've got. But the we are working on develop, you know, the future future flood risk uh, data. And as we you know, which is using 2D models in the riverine, um, in the riverine environment, right? The intent is that once we have consensus-based approach on how to apply climatic changes into the riverine setting, that we can plug and play that information into those 2D models and we can see what the, the climate impacts are directly in those models and the resulting mapping, you know, in the interim. And we're, I don't think it's that far away, right? It's a few years out maybe, um, but in the interim, yeah, it's just, this is what we've got, you know, plus two plus three meets the specific directives within the executive order. And you know, that's what we're going to use for the, for the near term. Okay, great. That makes a lot of sense. Um, let's see, I'm going to try to get to maybe a couple more questions here. Um, David has has sort of a straightforward question. I, I don't know if if we have a necessarily a great answer if this has been considered, uh, but um, are there any thoughts on the impact that this might have for insurance companies in, in among the group here? Yeah, I can take that. Um, so if you think about it with insurance, there should not be a great impact to insurance at all without the RMS. And we've had this conversation with our flood insurance division. Um, the only thing is, if you have to meet that higher elevation, I think the way that we used to think about, you know, mapping and insurance is, I have plus two feet, plus three feet on my side, I should get this huge discount. But with risk grading, um, now that we're kind of skyrocketing back to actuarial rates, if you are down here and you get this discount, you still are going to have to go up here, maybe not here, over here. So it's really, really difficult to say that this will or will not 
impact insurance. If anything, it's going to be a positive impact, but I can't say that it's going to be a major impact due to that uh, swing to actual actuarial rates. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, that that makes sense. Thank you. Um, I got a question here. Um, it, it, I'll just uh, state the question in full. Is there, a, is there a grandfathering situation for FMRMS whenever the BFE changes, or would structures continue to be ineligible with increasing BFEs? I'm not 100% sure. I understand okay. the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I was sort of reading it as a as I was reading it aloud in real time. So um, it, it, whoever asked that, if you might be able to clarify that, perhaps we can we can get you an answer to that question. Um, I, I see Andrew's uh, writing out a question, or excuse me, an answer to a question. And I know we have a couple more to get to. Um, However, I think we're going to try and wrap up there. The The questions that we do have outstanding, what, what we'll do is uh, we'll get uh, written answers to those after the fact, and then we'll take um, all these Q&A answers and we'll sort of transcribe that and get it out to, to the group a, as follow-up. So you'll be able to see any any question and answer that we, we took in the chat or allowed. Um, you'll, you'll hopefully get your answers to that. Um, but so with that, what I'd like to do is uh, one more poll question, which is just a simple webinar uh, rating. And then I've got a few administrative announcements to get to after that. Um, and then uh, we'll wrap up. So if you wouldn't uh, mind, please, please go ahead and just uh, rate the webinar today. Okay, I'll give people another few seconds to weigh in. Okay. All right, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for uh, um, taking the time. To, to give us a, a quick rating there. So uh, final announcements, uh, just uh, continuing education credits, um, CECs and uh, certificates of attendance as well. Um, those will be um, applied to your records automatically. Those CECs, as long as your national level CFM will be sending out your certificate of attendance um, so that you have that for, for any purpose that you may need. Uh, again, those things will take about a week. Uh, we also have the recording from this event slides, uh, a transcription of the Q&A. So we'll be sending out all those things, including all the links that, that we sort of referenced today, if you want to check those out also. Uh, so please expect all that within about a week or so. Uh, and we'll be we'll be emailing you that stuff directly. So, so keep an eye on your inbox. Um, uh, final word, just want to um, thank our presenters today for, for sharing all this information. And then Thank you all of you for, for attending and, and engaging in the, the Q&A and um, uh, just taking time out of your busy schedules to, to join us this afternoon. So this is a quarterly webinar series. We'll be, we'll be coming back uh, with another one soon. So, so please keep an eye on your inbox for, for future webinar announcements and um, hope you all have a great rest of your week. So thanks so much, everybody, and take care. Bye. Hey guys, thanks.